the shape of the human body is changing dramatically. Worldwide, the prevalence of obesity has doubled in the last few decades. If you go back 50 years and you look at the proportion of the population that was considered obese, and you look at it now, it, it, it really is an epidemic. The number of obese children has tripled. The population is getting fatter. Nine million adults are overweight. An explosion of fat-related diseases. Now, with nearly two out of three Australians overweight, obesity is the new normal. I've been told I'm 31 BMI, BMI, which means that basically a third of my body weight is fat. What does science bring to the fight against fat? If we can understand how that enemy is working, then we'll be better equipped to be able to get in there and intervene. Our kids are at risk before they're even born. And there's a lot more than just conventional genetics at play. Of the 50 or so genetic variants that have been associated with obesity, that only contributes to less than 5% of the variation in body size. The increase in global obesity, some call it globesity, has been so rapid that it can't just be explained by eating too much or exercising too little. Are there things in our bodies? in our brains, in our environment, that conspire against our best efforts to lose weight. In this program, we'll see how science is answering your question, why am I still fat? It sounds paradoxical, but your body actually defends itself from your efforts to lose weight by helping you to keep the kilos on. It's an inbuilt survival mechanism controlled by our brain that we all share, and it's called the famine reaction. One of the major effects of the famine reaction is that it makes you hungrier. It increases your drive to eat. When Amanda Sellis encountered the famine reaction as a teenager, she didn't have a name for it. And instead of just saying, oh, yeah, I'm a normal girl having a famine reaction, I ate and said to myself, I'm a useless person, that's terrible, I've broken my diet, I, I'm hopeless, I can't do anything. And then I ate even more and I gained weight. And in six years, I actually went from 53 kilos to 93 kilos. I gained 40 kilos and I literally dieted myself fat. Amanda's personal experience now motivates her research. She leads the Tempo Diet Trial at the University of Sydney. These women are part of World First Research. They're at the start of a three-year study into the long-term effects of weight loss in 100 postmenopausal women. There's never been a study that's compared the effects of fast versus slow weight loss on the famine reaction head-to-head. -head. So it's new and it's different. Two types of diets are being compared. A very low energy diet of 800 calories a day for fast weight loss against a conventional diet for slow weight loss. The women in the study don't get to choose which one they're on. Keen Gardner and medical researcher Andrea is one of the participants. Controlling her weight has always been a bit of a struggle. It's been more of an issue at times, and generally I would say that I was a very classic yo-yo dieter all my life. But eating well with her family remains a joy. What generally I do is I kind of wait until... Clive does most of the cooking, so wait until um, he's decided what he's going to cook, and then I kind of fit in um, around that. Andrea is on the slow and steady diet in the Tempo trial. Husband Clive is not a dieter, but he's inspired by her determination. I'd never had to worry about what I eat, but on the other hand, I suppose, you know, I can drop dead of a heart attack just as easily as somebody who, was, who weighed more. I mean, I'd just be a thinner corpse, but I'd still be dead. And is adapted more to our diet than, than we have to hers. IT manager Jennifer Merity is part of the Tempo study too, but unlike Andrea, she's on the fast-track diet for rapid weight loss. 
it's a bit scary that I'm now eligible for a diet trial because technically I'm obese, which I never felt. Jenny's passionate about her horses, which she rides in eventing, the triathlon of horse sports. I think you probably don't notice when you're putting weight on and you just do things with the body that you've got. Did it start to affect your horse riding? I probably didn't look as elegant. I probably looked like one of those little kids on a Thelwellian pony, big and chunky and bopping around. Husband Peter needs to lose weight too and wants to follow Jenny's example. But when I open the fridge, somehow without any conscious control, that hand reaches out for the honey yogurt or something like that. It's like an addiction. Eight out of ten dieters who lose up to 10% of their body weight put it back on again within five years. Why is maintaining weight loss so difficult? And why do so many dieters hit a wall? That's exactly where Amanda's tempo study comes in. The longer you carry weight, the harder it is to lose it because the hypothalamus in your brain resets the amount of fat your body defends. The famine reaction keeps you craving food. I know how hard it is when you're trying to lose weight and nobody around will give you the right to feel hungry. Today, Andrew is in for a DEXA scan, a type of X-ray that measures the mass of fat, muscle and lean tissues, as well as the mineral density of bone. Using the different lines, we can calculate how much fat is in the different regions of the body. Gauging the impact of the famine reaction also means entering the body pod. It's like being shot into space, but it's only 20 seconds. <laughs> The pod is another way to measure body composition, this time using air displacement. The famine reaction alters your hormones in a way that tends to make your body very inclined to hold on to fat, particularly in the midriff region, and also makes your body more inclined to lose lean tissues such as muscle and bone. This gives an estimate, so fat mass is around 32% and lean mass is around 68%. Excellent. Some quiet time under the calorimetry hood measures Andrea's metabolic rate or how much fat she's burning. While the famine reaction increases your drive to eat, it also makes your body more fuel efficient. Remember to stay awake, Andrea, relaxed and awake. Why are you whispering? OK, so we have to be very quiet here because we want Andrea to remain relaxed but awake, and that's because we're measuring resting energy expenditure. And that, uncannily, it, it changes with weight loss, and it affects how many kilojoules you burn over the course of, of the day and affects how much you can eat without putting on weight. One assumption the Tempo trial is testing, through participants reporting how hungry they feel, is that rapid weight loss should be avoided because it makes the famine reaction stronger. We'll return to see what works for Jenny and Andrea when they get their first progress results. But diets don't work for everybody. Some need a more drastic intervention to lose weight rapidly. And as we'll see, even making it harder for food to fit in your stomach may not be enough. In Hobart, 52-year-old Deb Richardson has been waiting for a lap band operation for six years. I'm unfit, I feel unhealthy and I never feel well. And I want to change that. I want to start wanting to go out for walks and, and meeting new people and doing different things. I just need to be in amongst it. How do you feel about food? Food, I'm obsessed with food. Um, I think about food all the time. Deb's GP referred her for lap band surgery because of her inability to lose weight, along with type 1 diabetes, high blood pressure and a high BMI. It's currently 34. I think we would be hoping to lose about 30 kilos, which is a substantial amount for a lady who is not, not particularly big. Very good. Very good. For Deb, a bariatric surgeon offers her the last chance to avoid the life-threatening diseases that come with obesity. What I'd like you to do is to think of the lap band as a tool that we're going to give you to help yourself. 
this is the lap band here itself. You can see it's made out of a ring of silicon and on the inside is a balloon. And that balloon is attached to a tubing and an injection port. So if some saline is injected into the injection port, it will inflate the balloon and make the band a little bit tighter. And that will be under your skin on the tummy. And as we fill that balloon up, it just compresses the outlet of that little pouch. And it takes longer for the food to empty out of the pouch and into the stomach. So it's adjustable. And because it's keyhole surgery, it's relatively safe. That small piece of silicon has a powerful effect on the nerves that control appetite. Neurologist Amanda Page wants to unravel how those nerves allow the stomach to communicate with the brain. It's a really difficult situation once you're obese to actually lose that weight again. This experiment shows how weight gain actually resets the sense of feeling full. With a piece of stomach from a mouse, she hooks up the nerves that fire when receptors respond to stretching. There's a tension-sensitive nerve in the stomach, and we've placed a hook next to that nerve, and we've connected it to, to a cantilever system, and then we can actually record the nerve activity here. So if we place a weight onto this cantilever system... That's cleverly made of something like Lego. Yes, connects. <laughs> And slowly let it release. You can see that the nerve activity increases, the signals to the brain, if it was still in the mouse, would, would increase and it would tell the mouse that it was full. This is central to regulating appetite because without it, the brain wouldn't know when to stop eating. And here's the key. When she compares the stomachs of lean mice with obese ones, the response to stretch is dramatically reduced in the obese mice and doesn't return to normal. The same thing happens in humans. People will say, so why won't an obese person just stop eating? It's easy to stop eating. But actually, they're not giving those signals of fullness, so they can't. Finding a way to reset the receptors back to their lean condition may lead to a non-surgical therapy for obesity in the future. It's Deb's big day. Bariatric surgeon Stephen Wilkinson prepares to install her lap band. Deftly manipulating the laparoscopic instruments, Stephen introduces the lap band into the abdomen and pulls it around the stomach. Now, the band has got a locking mechanism. It's a bit like one of those cable ties. OK, so that's got the band pretty much, you know, perfect position there. So we'll put three or four stitches in just to fix it to the top part of the fat pad just over the esophagus. And just spot welds the stomach across the front of the band and it stops the band from slipping down. Stephen says the procedure has about the same risk profile as gallbladder surgery. It has a very low mortality rate. I've done about 3,000 lap bands. I've had one mortality, uh, which is tragic when that happens. It's a deceptively simple operation. It's taken less than 20 minutes, but it's got the potential to change Debbie's life forever. The long-term results are that people lose about 55% of their excess weight by about 10 years and maintain that. While Stephen performs another seven lap band operations today, Deb recovers from hers. I must admit, it's better than what I thought it was going to be. Life starts today for a second time, so that's good. Deb is going home tomorrow. I'll visit her in a few months' time to see how she's going. Oh, the contradictions. Our society values thinness and health, but at the same time encourages us to overeat and consume more. Ah, I love fat. <laughs> fat sticks to your ribs. Back in 1981, this ad was suspended from commercial television after a complaint by an advertising agency with food companies as clients. They reckon it's not good for the heart. <laughs> but what would they know? Get off the facts. Get it off. More than 30 years later, to what extent can we blame obesity 
on food manufacturers. Well, there's still resistance from some sections of the industry to labelling for healthy choice. And these days, nutritional science is thinking less about individual nutrient groups and more about finding the best mix in a balanced diet. Appetite isn't just a single thing. We have separate appetites for different major nutrient groups. We're talking here about carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Your appetite control automatically gives priority to protein. If your diet runs short, you make up for it by getting energy from fats and carbohydrates that taste like protein. You know, that sort of lip-smacking amino acid umami flavours. Diluting protein makes food cheaper to make. Good for business, but bad for your appetite control. That's the savoury snack food industry. Your potato chip is a protein decoy. It tastes like protein. Our bodies have evolved to associate those flavour cues with protein, but actually all you're getting is loaded up with more fat and carbs, leaving your protein appetite unfulfilled, and hence you're going to continue to snack and eat more. Those subversive extra calories explain a lot about why we get fat. Our white fat cells protect us by providing a safe home for lipids. That is, they keep the fats out of our organs. But when they get overloaded, they swell and burst, leaking lipid into the bloodstream. The body's defences go into red alert with an inflammatory reaction. This chronic, low-grade inflammation causes organ damage, resulting in cardiovascular and fatty liver disease, insulin resistance and diabetes. Anything that stops the obesity also stops this inflammation. In Toowoomba, at the University of Southern Queensland, Lindsay Brown researches the medicinal power of natural foods to counteract obesity and reverse its inflammatory effects. Or more specifically, fruit and vegetables of a certain colour. The colour, purple. Anthocyanin is a natural pigment, one of a range of compounds in plants that keep their systems healthy and potentially ours too. Which veggie has the highest anthocyanin? Uh, the, the purple carrots are by far the best with that. They've got an amazing amount of anthocyanin. And when we do this, right. the, the colour just goes the whole way through it. When it comes to fruits, who's the superstar? The superstar is the, the Queen Gunnard plum. It's a, it's a wonderful plum. So it's not just an ordinary purple plum. This has got five or ten times as much of the purple colour in it. And you can see it in there. Lindsay and his team tested the effects of anthocyanins on rats, fattened up on a diet similar to thick shakes, burgers and fries. The body mass index of these rats is 25 to 35, equivalent to the BMI of most of the Australian human population. What's happening as a result of obesity in these rats' bodies right now? Blood pressure is going up quite dramatically. The heart function is going down. The liver function is going down. The abdominal fat pads increase. The hormones go up. The whole of the body is being affected, and that's characteristic of obesity. And it's all linked together by this inflammatory response. It's all linked together because the inflammatory response occurs in every organ. There's no organ that is immune from that. And then, after eight weeks, he added anthocyanin-rich juice to the food of half the rats. Much to my surprise, actually, we found that the anthocyanins in purple carrots, in queen garnet plums, in all of these things, completely reverse all of those changes. So we haven't changed the diet. They're still getting this high-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. And yet, with that intervention, all of those parameters that characterise obesity are back to normal. That's incredible. That is incredible. And you think, wait a minute, this is not the sort of billion dollar multinational company type product. This is a carrot, this is a plum. The results with rats have led to human clinical trials, which are now underway. But beyond food, there seems to be something else driving obesity, especially in young children. <laughs> Evie's growing up in a country where nearly one in four children are overweight or obese, in a world where obesity is one of the leading threats to public health. How that will change in her lifetime depends on what we can learn from new science. Grandma. 
there's emerging research into synthetic chemicals that act like hormones and change the way our bodies react to fat. They're called obesogens. You can't find a group that are not exposed to these chemicals. 99 to 100% of Australian people have phthalates. 80 to 90 to 100%, depending on how and when they're measured, have bisphenols in their bodies. Plasticizers like bisphenols or BPA are almost impossible to avoid as they're common in our food packaging and consumer goods. It's also often used as a resin in the lining of household water supply. So that means even our drinking water is often contaminated with a degree of BPA as well. Our pipes. Yes. Leading our, to our taps. Our taps. The question is, even though these chemicals only stay in our bodies for a few hours, can exposure in children affect their obesity risk for the rest of their lives? In Brisbane, Bridget Ma makes house calls to measure their chemical load. Hello, Michelle. How Hi. are you? Baby Luke is about to turn three months old. To sample short-lived chemicals, Bridget takes wipes from his hands, which isn't always easy, and from his mum. Michelle's job is to collect samples of Luke's urine, her breast milk, even house dust over a period of time. Is she worried what they might reveal? Yes, I am concerned, and I would like to know, you know. Uh, there's, also, there's also part of me that's saying, well, if it's not relevant, then we also need to know that too, because you can get, you can get too uh, kind of paranoid about what you're putting into your child's body. Luke is one of 30 babies currently in the study that will eventually involve 100 or so. Their levels of chemical exposure from high to low are compared with their growth rates. Luke's development is tracked from birth with his body composition measured every six weeks. Like the bod pod in the Tempo study, there's a miniature version for babies. It's called a pea pod and it can give us an estimation of the baby's percent body fat and lean body mass. This is the first study of its kind in Australia and perhaps the world to search for links between short-lived environmental chemicals and obesity in the first six months of life. Well done, baby Luke. When babies outgrow the pea pod, Bridget uses a handheld device to monitor their growth rates. Her BMI is 21.6 and impedance is 6.50. At nine months old, Evie loves her food. Her mum, Paula, tries to slow her weight gain through diet. Sometimes I worry that perhaps she's growing a little bit too fast because I know that that can um, increase your risk of obesity and metabolic disease later in life. And she's just learned something else disturbing about BPA. Evie loves crinkly paper and in an emergency, sometimes to settle her, I'll give her a receipt. Um, and sometimes she even eats them. Um, and Bridget has told me that actually that is one of the highest sources of BPA, which is very concerning to me. The level of BPA in the thermal paper of shop receipts is more than 100,000 times higher than in canned foods. It's still too early in this study to link the variability of growth rates in babies with chemical exposure, but there's alarming evidence from elsewhere about the effects of BPA exposure in school-age children. Those children with the highest levels of exposure have a 35 to 40 per cent increased risk of being obese compared to those children with the lowest level of exposure. The likely explanation is that BPA is an endocrine disruptor that interferes with the hormone system. But could obesogens be reshaping our genetic destiny as well? There's this other science called epigenetics where the environment changes not the structure of the gene but the function of the gene. This epigenetics is a normal part of our human development. That's the way babies grow. So that organs develop and change through these epigenetic processes. It's when they get hijacked by environmental toxicants that things go wrong. After six months in the Tempo diet trial, the answer to losing weight for Jenny and Andrea depends on overcoming their biological drive to keep eating. Andrea, on the slow and steady diet, has lost eight kilos. Jenny, on the fast track diet, has lost 14 kilos so far. That's actually 
only seven kilos of fat. So Jenny, wow. you, you've lost double that, and Andrea, you've lost more than that. Oh, that's scary. Good Lord. Yeah, it's a sizable amount of, of, oh. of fat to lose. So well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Up to now, it looks like Jenny's low energy diet has actually prevented her famine reaction from making her want to eat more. With the fast weight loss that you are on, Jenny, it, yeah. it feels like the famine reaction is going undercover. And can you see what's happening here to your yeah. appetite? Did you notice that? Yeah, during the yeah trial? I just couldn't be bothered eating almost. Wow. This early result seems to contradict the notion that crash diets are not the way to go. But this trial has a couple of years to run yet to really know which diet is best. Amanda wants more women to join the study. We encourage our clinical trial participants to be like the boss of their body and say, oh, I can see your famine reaction. I see what you're doing to my hunger. And for them to be aware of what's happening and to know that it's nothing to feel bad about. It's just, you know, you're a normal woman having a famine reaction. Back in Hobart, life has changed for Deb too. Five months after her lap band operation, I've caught up with Deb to take her out to lunch. Ah, thank you. I still find it really hard to cut the portion size down. When I look at it, I think I can do double, mm. but I definitely can't. How has your weight changed, life after lap band? Oh, good. It's done really well. I've lost 16 and a half kilo. Congratulations. Thank you. Excuse me, you've got a mouthful, but that's... Impressive. It is. That's more than halfway to your target. It is. Almost to the to the kilo. Mm. Yeah. So it is good. How do I'd, you feel about that? I'd, I would have liked it to come off faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even so, she still feels judged. I actually had a lady in a shop say to me that, oh, you took the easy way out. Oh. I actually, was for the first time, felt bad about having the lap band. And then I thought, no, I had it for medical reasons, not... You know, it wasn't an easy option for me, so um, I don't go into that shop anymore. <laughs> yeah. This journey to explore obesity has opened my eyes. My weight is in the healthy range, even though I eat what I like. My excuse is that I'm just a skinny bloke. But while a healthy diet and more exercise is better for everyone anyway, when it comes to losing weight, it's not as simple as that. We shouldn't rely on excuses to answer the question, why am I still fat, or even, why am I not fat? But we can rely on new science to improve our public health efforts to tackle obesity. Look beyond the easy assumption that getting fat is about being lazy or lacking willpower, and we can see the full picture the powerful biological and environmental reasons why we put weight on and regain what we manage to lose.